Hi, this is Simply Wing Chun, just coming back to you again. Um, last time I did a, a, a little clip, I did a first section of Sunim Town. So what I thought today is we'll do the second section of Sunim Town. Second section of Sunim Town, effectively simpler, but no less important. So to recap, first section of Sunim Town is called Gong Link. It's about elbow energy, it's about structure, it's about energy development, it's about positional, it's about muscular isolation. There's lots of core ingredients to go together. It is your foundation of everything that you're going to do. Having developed and practiced Sunim Town first section for two, three, four months, religiously, diligently, etc., etc., you work really hard, you started to develop it, you've started to learn how to push with the elbow, pull with the elbow, you started to develop energy. However, you want to classify energy, but we call it elbow energy, the ability to drive forward, not using all the muscle groups, but specific muscle groups, be able to relax through because we don't need to be tension every area possible. So you've got your elbow energy. That's great. What are you going to do with it? So the second section of Sunim Town is purely focusing on that, and it's known as um, farging. Farging is inch energy, that was really what I was going to work with it. So farging is short bursts of energy, short range energy. So why is farging important? Why is short range energy important? Well, there are lots and lots of reasons, okay? So the first thing is that when you're punching, if you punch tense all the way through, as you're punching tense all the way through, muscle groups that you don't require for the speed and acceleration. Remember, force equals mass, mass times acceleration, so the faster you punch, the, you know, the more power you're going to deliver. The more you put your body in behind it, the more power you're going to deliver. It's, it's an equation of two. So the faster you can accelerate your weapon, in this case maybe a fist, and the faster you can fire it off, the more damage it's going to do, because it's going to have more punchy force and more and force more energy behind it and at the same time putting the body in behind it is also going to give it structure. So we want to learn how to relax muscle groups that resist that, that acceleration and focus only on putting energy where it's required. Okay. So when you're hitting something, if you're hitting an object at this distance, being tense here doesn't hurt them, it doesn't affect them and it doesn't help you because you're slowing yourself down. Being tense even here doesn't help you. You want to only need tension effectively upon impact, so we tend to say within the first inch or two inches, or for you metric people, 25 millimetres or 50 millimetres, okay? That's short range, not on extension, because if you're hitting an extension, your arm's already starting to decelerate, you've got no power, so when you're hitting an object, you're always going to be hitting with a bent elbow, but you want to learn to accelerate the force into, though not through and out the other side of, and certainly not on the surface of an object, so you've got that sinking energy and that penetrative force. And that's that, that farging, that inch energy. So I'll give you a practical example. If you have children, if you borrow children, nieces, nephews, and you take them down the park, you put them on the swing. You put them on a swing and you start to push and you just use the mentality of energy on all the time. So you just push them on the swing and you push them on the swing and you push them on the swing and they're going to get to an angle and they're almost falling off and they're really bored because they're just hanging there. You're not doing anything, you're just constantly pushing. Not a lot of fun for the kid, a bit of hard work for you and they put them at risk because they might fall off and bang their head. What you really want to do is put them on the swing and use farging. Short energy push and then you relax off and it swings back a bit and short energy push and you relax off and eventually, if you're really good, you get, well anyway, you get the principle. You get them swinging. Okay, constant energy all the way through is not productive. On off energy keeps on building and adding and it's, it's much more productive. And that's really what we're focusing on in the second section of Sunium Town. So, it's all about this short, sharp burst of energy and focusing on how you do that. So obviously, we'd have started with the basic stance, we'd have actually gone through the first section of Sun Tao first, which I've covered before. So your farging, your short, sharp burst of energy, is about relaxing, 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 relax, snap, and then relax. Relaxing, and then waiting, and waiting, drive, and relax. Pull up sharply to here. What I do is I just let my hands turn around till they touch. Short, sharp little hit with the heel of the palm, Relax, keep my elbows in, bring my hands round, wait till my hands come out in front of me, and then it's that snap, and then relax. There's nothing in that move, so put nothing in that move. The fact sound needs to go out horizontally, it's not a pivot. If it's a pivot, it's easily seen, easily covered, risk your elbow joint, it's a linear drive. So from here, it's relax, 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 drive, and then there's nothing in the move, so don't worry about that. Draw the elbows in for jump, forward, that little, little forward energy there, little forward energy with Tarn Sao, little energy, short, sharp burst with Jut Sao, Jut Sao means jerking energy, Pew up towards their eyes, press down, relax, lift up, relax, Hoon Sao to come back, and then relax, a very short little movement. 
but equally important, relies on the gun lick of the first section to practice farging of the second section. You'll notice that when we're doing it, we're going down in different directions. We're going out, we're going back, we're going forward, we're going back, we're going up, we're going down. We're doing lots of 3D environment training, and that's because fighting is a 3D environment. You need to be powerful going outwards and pulling back. You need to be powerful going outwards. You need to be powerful going down. There's lots of reasons why, and we're training muscle groups to do that job. I'm not going to go into the, to the, um, the whole detail of it, because without going into a lot of muscle groups, it gets a little bit lost sometimes. But you'll notice here, for example, we do something really weird like this. And again, I've, I've heard people say, oh, well, that's because you're smashing down or you're striking up. And, you know, could it be used for that? I'm sure it could. Would I do it? Why would I? No. But why would I, if my hand was low, rise up and strike with this when I could just as easily rise with a punch? It doesn't make sense. Um, for me, this is very much about isolating muscle groups. I want my body to work as efficiently as I can. So I'm, when I'm pressing down, I take the elbow out, because we, we, we've done pressing down actually with the elbow, so I take the elbow out and I press down, and I lift up. It's all about using the deltoids and the shoulders and all the rest of it. It's about taking the elbow out of the equation, so I'm not wholly reliant upon using my elbow all the time. There's a time when I may have used the gun sound to cover, a, to, 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 to cover off something, or to trap, or to pin, or to deflect, or whatever your choices are. It does leave a vulnerability. And, you know, I don't want to have to come back to then go back out and forward. If I have to, I may have to steal the centre line back just using the whole of the forearm because my arm's already extended. Is it ideal? No. But then is there any ideal in a fight? In a street fight, it's already gone wrong because you're there. So you're having to do what you can do. So Sudim uh, Town's second section to me is about using that short, sharp burst of energy. It's a solo exercise. Really not right to talk about fighting application within a forearm because it's you and you alone. Um, but nevertheless, sometimes it just helps you to visualise why you're doing a manoeuvre. If that helps you, great. For me, it's about being precise. So when I do the gong sao, I'm thinking about using my elbow to drive these two bones, the end of those two bones, which is where my power base is. There's no power base in my fingers and my palm. It's all about the end of these bones, taking the thickness of my wrist and transitioning it visually onto the end of the palm. That's where my power base is. And then driving that down. In training, I always aim to drive down towards the center of my heels. Drive down towards the centre of my heels. Not an application. Don't get me wrong, you can turn to an application. If somebody's trying to arm lock you or wrist lock you, one of the quickest ways to protect yourself is to get your arm barred against the body so there's no leverage. But, you know, that's a kind of an emergency technique in its own right. For now it's about a form, it's about a set of principles, a set of movements. So, relax, 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 drive, switch off. Relax, 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 drive, switch off. Pull up sharply. Okay, as I'm pulling around, Wait till my hands touch, and in this instance from here, short, sharp heel of the palm. Do not extend my arm. As soon as I extend my arms, my arms are going to move outwards, because I'm, as I extend, my arms will be limited by the width of my body. So it's a short, sharp little burst of energy here. Relax. Tuck the elbows in, bring the hands around in front, and then I do the front gum sow. And again, driving down diagonally. Notice I'm using the heel of the palm. That's where the power is. Don't put your fingertips down, because... If you're using it against something, the last thing you want to do is let your fingertips do the intercepting, not the heel of the palm. From here, there's no purpose in that move, do no purpose. Lansau, however, you'll notice is slightly lower than the shoulder. If it's horizontal and you do ever use Lansau for whatever reason, because this is solid bone, any pressure applied here will attack the body. So have it lower down. So it's got resistance, but you can roll out of it. And that's, that's more of a chunk you usage, but we'll, we'll cover that later. So from here, down to, down to here, relax. Should they touch? Should they be spaced? Should they be overlapped? Should they underlap? And again, it's, it's, some people are just kind of over anal because it's a form and it's just you. Um, so should they touch or should they not? You know, it's up to you. You know, there's no real, nobody can, nobody can ever tell you there's a reason why you do it that's got any practicality about it. It's personal preference. My personal preference is not to have them overlapped or underlapped to here. Should it be left on top or right on top? Again, I was taught left on top. I've always done it. I always teach it exactly the same, so there's consistency in teaching. Is it right as opposed to that? Does it matter? You know, are we, some, are we sometimes getting fundamentally hooked up into the wrong amount of detail in the wrong place? So from here, I would do it here. 
I would expect to see the, the fax out come out horizontal and drive. I don't want to see the arm drop down. If you're ever going to use fax out, it's be, probably because you're coming across the top of the limb. You don't want to be dropping the arm down and then caught screwing it out. I would expect to see it coming through and being driven, and you do not want it to be pivotal. You know, a tax like this, like this, may look great in a James Bond film, but they're not going to work. You're just going to break your hand. Your hand is made up of lots of tiny little bones, which in this direction are very strong, but in this direction are going to snap like a twiglet, so they're going to break. So, coming up, doing a fat sal that's pivotal, A, can be seen coming a long way off, and B, when it lands, it's, it's, it's purely pivotal energy, not linear energy, and it's going to hit with the bone. Where from here, if you can relax, 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 and drive, then at least as you drive, you can use the end of this bone into this point and drive it into the soft points of somebody's throat or something, which is where I personally, if somebody's trying to kidnap my little 13 year old daughter, it would be one of the targets I'd go for immediately. So, that's how, relax, 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 get the elbows in front of the wrist so it's now elbow driven out, and because there's no purpose in this second move, I don't put any purpose in it. The purpose in the next move is my elbows are up, whether it's a, a technique or whatever position I find myself in, the concept is my elbows are up, so I drop my elbows in and I do a double jump out. And I drop my elbows down. Should my hands be parallel? Should they be angles? You know what? The wrong detail. Forward energy. Get your structure. That's the right detail. From here, a little bit of forwarding into tarn a little corkscrewing just to make sure the elbows come in a little bit more. And then you've got the jut sound. The jut sound is the short, sharp pull in. I've had people say elbows out. Again, it's about an energy. It's a short, sharp burst. Pull with the triceps as fast as you can. Relax. And then up into their eyes. Is it BUG striking to their eyes or is it just giving yourself a bit of a bridge and a, and a, and a gap between the two? Depends on, on the purpose you're doing it at the time. In the form, it's just an extension. It's as simple as that. And then as I said, just press the arms down to about waist level, lift the shoulders up, uh, sorry, the, the wrists up to shoulder level. Small hoon sow. And then draw back. So in the first section of Sunim Tao, you learn elbow energy, you learn posture, you learn awareness, you learn structural integrity of pushing forward and pulling back, you learn to angle the forearms correctly, you learn what muscle groups to use on, what to turn off, you learn audio visual awareness, you learn muscle isolation, you learn to do one thing with one hand while doing something else with the other hand, you learn to do one thing as in stretch, uh, tensing up the legs or natural tension of the legs through the posture in the lower body by relaxing the upper body muscles that you don't require. In the second section you take all of that use the posture the stance and all the bits that go with it and maintain it all the way through but then your focus is on short sharp bursts of energy on off energy okay so sometimes it's called you'll hear terms called gonglik and sunglik gonglik is when you're using energy on against somebody let's say you're here and somebody tries to do a pack sow or something and sunglik is when you switch off the energy when somebody does a lap sow rather than resisting it switch off don't fight it just go with it and let the other hand do something else if you tense when they do a lap sow it'll affect your body mass if you relax you're still vertical to do the other hand so gonglik and sunglik are energy on energy off and we're practicing both of those in the second section the farging is the the travel gonglik is the energy farging is, is focused is what the focus of the second section is all about so by the time you've done the first section and the second section of Sunim Tao, you've done your gunglick and done your farging, you're ready for the third section. And all the third section will do for you is put the, the, put the energy and the release together under known tools. And by the time you've done that, you've got your physical alphabet. If you're ever going to learn um, a language, you need to have an alphabet. Once you've got an alphabet, you can make words. When you've got words, you can make sentences. When you've got the sentences and understanding of grammar, you can have conversation. In Wing Chun, you need your forms, you need your tool sets. It's a bit like opening up a Swiss Army knife. There's lots of tools in there, and you need to understand each one and its purpose and its, and its benefit. You know, if you don't understand what they're for, you're going to use them wrong. You know, um, so the, the old saying: if all you have in your hand is a hammer, everything's going to look like a nail. You're going to hit everything, no matter what it is. But the more tools you have, the more you can deploy, the more you understand, the better selection you will make. You'll start making better choices, and those better choices are going to give greater rewards. So you've got Sunim Tao as your tool set, okay? What we then do is we then take Sunim Tao and then we start take, extrapolating out a technique whether it's Fuk Sao, Bong Sao, Pan Sao, whatever the tool is, and we're going to put them with a the partner and we're going to drill them. And we're going to do repetition, repetition, repetition. And that's like taking your physical alphabet and combining them into a physical word, whether it's Tan, Da, or whatever it may happen to be. 
Once you've done that, you can then start doing some interaction. You know, in Chisau, you can you can use your Fuxau, Tansau, Bongsau. You can then go off and explore other applications. You can explore the reasons why you do them, where the weaknesses are, and what you do, where the strengths are, and what your partner does, where your strengths are, and what you do, where your weaknesses are, and your partner. And you start having this physical conversation. So you've taken your alphabet, combined your words. You take your words and you make sentences. And she sounds a bit like a question and answer. How are you going to deal with that? I'm going to deal with it like this, or whatever it may be. And you have this interaction. It's not just a one-way answer question, answer question, but it can be a conversation that ebbs and flows, and it's natural. It's a natural flowing conversation on a physical only level. At the end of that, you've then got your one attack, one defend, your street self-defense, however you in your schools um, practice them, um, but has, has some level of wrapper of, of reality around it whether you pressure test it, whether you go outside like we do and you do the rabbit run and where we, we send, make people walk up to the side of the building where we've got three people loitering and there's no, the, the person walking up has no idea if they're going to get attacked, how they're going to get attacked, are they going to get harassed, what's going to happen and we try and put some scenario training together to make this as realistic as classroom can be with health and safety in mind and all the other things that we, we want to do. It's what I learned in my close protection work. We did killing house training. We didn't always use live rep weapons. We used wax bullets. We used cardboard targets sometimes, and we just built up to as much reality as we could do without causing um, life-threatening injury to, to each other or ourselves. So you want to attack, one defend, or whatever your practicality is. That's the end point. That's the final conversation. That's the debate. It's the argument part of a conversation. So it starts with a, an alphabet, goes into words, goes into sentences, goes into con conversation, and then perhaps one day it becomes an argument or a debate. Um, if you do it right, it's a debate. A debate is controlled, and it's and it's it, you're, you're not losing it, and you're not just ranting and raving, but you're you're using your tools in a semi-controlled manner. So in other words, as mentally controlled as you can be under the duress of threat and and, and um, damage. That's where it fits. Okay. Without the first section, you haven't got your foundations started. Without the second section, you haven't got the tools to then learn how to deploy them, and then the next stage will be the third section. Um, that's it for today. I hope that was useful and I'll be back.